In every work, there are those who are in front of the spotlight, but there's somebody behind that spotlight too. And they have to learn how to work hand in hand. For example, the person in the spotlight would have no spotlight to shine on them if somebody wasn't back there running it, right? But then at the same time, the person running the spotlight would have nobody to put it on unless there was somebody up there to put it on. Do you understand? We're to work together in the Lord's church. And when you go through the New Testament, there are some very prominent men who were definitely in the spotlight. Jesus would be one that sticks out in my mind. Paul would be another one that sticks out in my mind. Peter, Simon Peter, the apostle, would be yet another person who would be, from our perspective, in the spotlight. We generally hear a lot about them, don't we? Well, what do you know about a man by the name of Barnabas? Now, Barnabas, when you look at it, was one of those guys who really, proverbially speaking, wasn't in the spotlight all the time, but you can bet he was working. You can bet he was a vital part of the gospel of Jesus Christ going throughout the whole known world. And then just think of this. Somebody has to take it out there. Well, then once you take it out there and you make some converts, who's going to help root them down? Who's going to help them grow in the faith? Men like Barnabas, for sure. You see now why in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. All of us have our jobs to do. All of us have our role. Some people are going to get in the spotlight. Some people are going to have to be behind the spotlight. But we all need one another. Tonight, we're going to talk about Barnabas, the son of consolation. We decided to do on Sunday nights, Bible characters, A to Z. Last week, we talked about angels, which was, uh, I see now, that needs to be like a six-month study. But we got one sermon. Barnabas could be likewise, but we're going to get one sermon tonight in regard to Barnabas, the son of consolation. Four C's. Number one, we're going to see some compliments given to Barnabas by the brethren and by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, when the Holy Spirit says something good about you, that's right. And generally, if the apostles said a good word about you, that's right too. Number two, we're going to see that Barnabas was courageous. You ever wonder who it was that introduced Saul to the apostles? It was Barnabas. That took a level of courage that many of us may not have today. And then number three, we'll see that Barnabas was a great companion. Who you want to take around with you everywhere you go? Paul chose Barnabas. And Barnabas, just by getting to be one of Paul's close companions, he saw some impressive things. Sometimes it pays to hang around with the right people. And then number four, we'll see that Barnabas was compassionate. Would you work with John Mark after he left you deserted? Here you are in the middle of the Lord's work and John Mark, for whatever reason, decides I'm going home. Now, would you forgive that man and work with him again? Barnabas would. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now let's get started. Let's look in Acts chapter 4. We'll read here tonight several scriptures throughout the book of Acts. And we'll try to give a little explanation. We'll make some application and call it a day. Is that all right? That's all right. Let's see some compliments here paid to Barnabas. Let's look in Acts chapter 4 beginning in verse 36 for the sake of time. The Bible says in Acts 4 and verse 36, and Joseph, if you look in the American Standard Version, it's Joseph, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas. Now in the King James it has parentheses which shows a parenthetical, which is being interpreted the son of consolation a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, that may be the island of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I think there's enough right there to make a whole sermon, but just for the, the broad scope, we'll talk just about a few things. Barnabas, his name is in 28 specific verses of the New Testament, and far and away, the majority of them are in the book of Acts. So if you want to learn anything about Barnabas, you'll have to read the book of Acts. Obviously, his name was Joseph or Joseph at birth, but it seems that due to his generous nature, you see that? What did he do? Having land, sold it. Now, there's another incidental there. With him being a Levite, it was against the law of Moses for the Levites to sell any of their land. 
but Barnabas did no wrong here, obviously showing that he was not bound to the law of Moses. It was done, technically. Uh, practically, it goes on, but that's another story. So, due to his generous nature, the apostles seem to have nicknamed him Barnabas, which obviously means the son of consolation or maybe the son of exhortation. Really, when you look at that word, it's often translated as comfort, but probably the best way that we in our, I guess you'd say vernacular, our language that we would refer to Barnabas would be the son of encouragement. Now, I think we'll see that very clearly if we can... If I can preach this sermon right, we'll see very clearly that Barnabas was the son of encouragement. And I can tell you this, no matter how long you've been a member of the church, you need some encouragement. We need some barnabas if that's the way, maybe Barnabai among us, for sure. Now, I want you to look at a couple other things with me. Look in Acts chapter 11. Still considering this first point of our sermon, some compliments paid to Barnabas. Obviously, for the apostles themselves to call him the son of consolation, they were right about it. I mean, and they, they didn't call him that just to belittle him. That's what he was. He was an encourager. Can you imagine what it would take to encourage an apostle? Well, Barnabas could do it. Let's look here now in Acts 11, beginning in verse 22. And let's see what the Holy Spirit has to say about Barnabas. Acts 11 and verse 22, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas. Key thing to know, when you hit Acts 14 and verse 14, the Bible there says, the apostles, Paul and Barnabas. Now, was Barnabas an apostle of Christ? The answer to that is no, he was not. So how is Barnabas an apostle? He is an apostle of the church. What does the word apostle mean? The word apostle means one sent forth with a message or commission. Well, who sent forth Barnabas with a message or commission? And they, they who? The church which was in Jerusalem. And they, that's the church which was in Jerusalem, sent forth Barnabas, sent forth, maybe you could look at it as an apostle, and definitely in chapter 14, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, now look at this and watch carefully, and had seen the grace of God, was glad. Now, that shows right there. Barnabas was glad to see the gospel spreading. Barnabas was glad to see the work of other gospel preachers doing well. Sometimes that's not the case today. Sometimes we want to more see a preacher get into a train wreck and make a mess than to actually succeed. Barnabas was not that way. And was glad and exhorted. He built up. He encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now watch this. Look at what the Holy Spirit says about Barnabas. For he was a good man. That phrase is very, very rare to find in the Bible. As a matter of fact, most of our religious friends would say and take a verse totally out of its context. There is none good. No, not one. For he was a good man. Who said that? The Holy Spirit said that. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost. That is, he's an inspired man. When you look back in Acts 13 and verse 1, he was either a prophet or a teacher. Pick, you, pick whichever one. He was inspired. So for Barnabas to be full of the Holy Ghost or full of the Holy Spirit, he was inspired and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Barnabas did a great work. Friend, we need a Barnabas. Who will be the Barnabas of this congregation? We need more than one. Matter of fact, most of us would line up and say, hey, you want to be like Jesus? Yeah, I want to be like Jesus. Everybody wants to be like Jesus. You want to be like Paul? Yeah, I want to be like Paul. Hey, you want to be like Peter? Yeah, I want to be like Peter. Who wants to be like Barnabas? Nobody. But I can promise you, to the success of any and every local congregation, you need a Barnabas. You need a son of consolation, that's for sure. Now let's get some application. Who says there's no such thing as a good man? Who says there's no such thing as a good man? The Bible says plainly that Barnabas was a good man. Absolutely so. Now listen to this. When we obey the first principles of the gospel and then continue to allow the gospel 
to penetrate our heart, soul, mind, spirit, everything about us, we're good men. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. You've obeyed the first principles of the Lord's gospel. You're abiding in the doctrine of Christ. You're a good man. Let me prove it to you. Go with me to Psalm 37. Let me show you this. Psalm 37. Brock, you're preaching a, about a New Testament person going to the Old Testament. I do that all the time. It's Bible. It's the same God-inspired Genesis as the one that's inspired Revelation, isn't it? It's the Word of God. Look at me in Psalm 37 and verse 23. What makes us good men? What made Barnabas a good man? Is that a relative term? No, that's an absolute term. He was a good man. What makes us good men? Psalm 37, 23 says, For the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. How was Barnabas a good man? He followed the Lord's way. Trust not in thine own heart. Lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Barnabas trusted in the Lord with all his heart, and therefore in so doing, the Lord directed his path. When the Lord directs your path, where do you think the Lord is going to direct you? He's going to direct you in the right way. Barnabas was a good man because he obeyed the first principles of the gospel and he continued abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Number one, some compliments given to Barnabas are some of the best in all of the Bible. If ever we could choose to be like anybody, Barnabas isn't real bad. Now number two. We'll see that Barnabas was courageous. Let's go to the book of Acts again, but this time in chapter 9. You know, Saul, as he was known at the time, Saul was a rough character when you look at it. We know him generally as the Apostle Paul, but he didn't start off as an apostle, did he? He started off pretty roughly, didn't he? He was an enemy of the gospel, and Saul, as he was known, was granted the authority from the high priest to enforce punishment. In Acts 8... And then in Acts 9, but let's look here in Acts 9, verse 26 and 27. Let's see if we can see this. Acts 9, 26. And when Saul, what Saul? The same Saul that was breathing out murderous accusations. The same Saul that was hailing men and women of the church and taking them into prison. Same Saul. Something happened between Acts 9, 1 and, and where we're reading. You can read that on your own. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Wouldn't you be? Wouldn't you be? Here this man more than likely had put someone you knew, maybe your own kin, into prison. And I'm sure it wasn't very nice. Remember, Saul was a young man standing by when they stoned Stephen. Now you may think, hey, this guys he's just playing us. He's acting like he's one of us, but he's not. He's going to get in, see how we do things, and then he's going to overthrow us. They were afraid of him. And believe not that he was a disciple. But thank God for verse 27. But who? But the son of encouragement, the son of consolation, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Do you realize the level of courage that had to take? Could you imagine being the only one? Here, Saul, Paul as we know him, brings himself to the disciples and says, boys, I'm one of you. And they say, oh, you ain't no one of us. Hey, man, you back off. We're scared of you. We know what you can do. What do you want? Everybody's afraid of him, but who? But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them plainly how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, this may be hard to comprehend, but this was a crucial time in the development of the New Testament church. And this may be even harder to see. Do you realize that Saul was a babe in Christ right here? Isn't that something when you think about it? Paul, a babe in Christ? Yeah. Now, do you realize babies are weak? They're fragile? They need a different kind of care? Do you, do, you under, do you see that? Do, could you imagine if no one had stepped forth and said, hold time out, boys. He's one of us. 
Now imagine if somebody did you like that when you had obeyed the gospel. Everybody was afraid of you. Nobody would have anything to do with you. What would that have done to you? Do you think Saul was that much different? He needed some encouragement, didn't he? Where did he get it? He didn't get it from just anybody. Who stepped up? Who had the courage to step up and say, I know this man is genuine? It was Barnabas, wasn't it? Could you imagine? Now, I know the Lord would have used someone. But you, st you keep reading the book of Acts. Who took the gospel to the whole known world? Paul. And now you think about that. The Lord would have used somebody. Somebody would have been used. It would have been accomplished. But imagine if Saul would have been stomped out right there. Imagine if he'd have went right back to Judaism. He'd already done enough damage, hadn't he? Imagine if he went back now shunned and mad. You hadn't thought about that, had you? Do you see the courage of Barnabas to step up and do that? Friend, let me say it plainly. We need a Barnabas. Who will be the Barnabas of this congregation? Now let's get a little application here. We defend those we know, won't you? Would you defend your wife? Yeah. Why? You know your wife. Would you defend your children? Oh, yeah. You know your children, don't you? Well, certainly we do. Barnabas knew that Saul was genuine. And listen to this plainly. Sooner or later, someone is going to have to put their neck on the chopping block for you. You remember I said that. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have to lay their neck out on the chopping block for you. Someone is going to have to take a risk on you. Do you realize that? Barnabas was courageous enough and had obviously seen Saul enough and spent enough time with him to realize he's genuine. And he stepped up to the plate and did it. Has anyone ever stepped up for you? I hope so. I've had several people step up for me. Joseph Barr is the first one to come to mind. When I decided I wanted to go to preaching school, who do you think I knew in the Church of Christ? Who do you think I... I didn't know anyone. And he wrote a letter putting his name on the line for Brock Shanks. Now you think about that. I'm telling you, if you ever want to go preach... Somebody will put their neck on the line for you. You need to think about that. Melvin Sapp. Do you know one of the reasons why I was hired here by the elders? Why I had a nice, beautifully written letter by Melvin Sapp that carried a whole lot of weight with it. Do you see that? Sooner or later, someone will have to stick their neck out on the line for you or maybe you'll be blessed enough where you can... Stick your neck out on the line for someone else. You need to think about that. Barnabas was indeed courageous. He stuck his neck out on the line for Saul. How'd that work out? How'd that work out? That was a very wise decision, wasn't it? Well, we'll see if it works out with Joseph Barr and Melvin Sapp sticking their neck out on the line with me, but you never can tell. Go with me to 1 John 3. Let me get you an application here. When we really realize things and really realize what the Bible teaches, we ought to defend one another. Hadn't we? And I think when we understand what is taught in 1 John 3 here and verse 16, sticking your neck out on the line for someone is the least we can do sometimes. Speak up and say a good word about a brother. Right? 1 John 3, 16. John says this, Hereby perceive we the love of God because... He laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, what do you mean, Brock? I mean, if you will die for somebody, wouldn't you speak a good word about them? What did Barnabas do? He had the guts enough and was courageous enough to stand up and say, boys, you don't need to be afraid of him. He's one of us. Number two, Barnabas was courageous. He is the one who introduced or brought Saul, who we know as Paul, to the apostles. Now, number three. Barnabas was obviously a great companion. He went, to Paul, went with Paul to numerous places to further the gospel of Christ. And let's look in Acts 13 here. Acts 13 begins the first, as it's so-called, evangelistic or missionary journey. Barnabas got to go, man. Can you imagine that? 
Here's a man that's behind the spotlight getting to be with the man in the spotlight. Something to think about. He was obviously a great companion. Some people can work with just anyone. That's a rare trait. I can tell you that right now. Let's look in Acts 13 here and let's read a little scripture. Acts 13 beginning in verse 5. Let's see what, as Barnabas being a great companion of Paul, let's see what all he got to see. Acts 13, 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. That's John Mark. Verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. Bar means son of. So evidently his daddy's name was Jesus. No, not Jesus Christ. Jesus was a common name in New Testament times among the Jews. Verse 7. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But, here's a bad one. Elamus the sorcerer. That's the same as Bar-Jesus, this false prophet of the Jews. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now you're about to see what happens when you try to hinder the gospel and the apostles around. You don't want to do that. Of course, there are no apostles of Christ living today, but here's the point. Barnabas was such a great companion. Look what all he got to see. Verse number 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, that is, he's in, an inspired man. He's an empowered apostle, definitely at this time. Set his eyes on him and said, Oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Mm. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, verse 11, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. Believed throughout the Bible is a way of saying obeyed. He was convicted by the evidence, and he obeyed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, I don't know if anyone in here plays any musical instrument at all, but think of this. Musically speaking, it takes more to make it in music than just being talented, a talented musician. You have to find people who you click with, people you can make music with. Do you understand that principle? If everyone who was talented at an instrument could just, if that's all it took, then, then everybody would be famous who's great at an instrument. But there are some people who are great at an instrument that you'll never know because they've never found those people with whom they click. Do you understand that? There has to be a closeness, a kindred, a, a camaraderie that encourages creativity. D do you see that? If you play an instrument, I think you understand what I'm talking about. It's more than just being great at, at guitar. You have to have people like-minded around you. Now think of that in regard to the gospel. It's really no different. Do you know when I've seen people work best? When they're comfortable with those they're around. When they fully trust those people they're around. Now why would Paul take Barnabas with him? I say, brought read up in the chapter. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. Okay, I can't argue with that. But as you see, when he had the opportunity to choose, who did he choose? Who would you choose? Think of that. Now, in order to be comfortable with someone, it takes time. Time is very precious. Paul and Barnabas took the time to be comfortable with one another. Now let's get an application. What kind of person do you want to be around? A slanderer? A gossip? A busybody? No, I, I don't think you want to be around them, do you? And obviously in order for the Apostle Paul to spend the time and work with Barnabas as he did, Barnabas was obviously an easygoing, level-headed fellow who worked hard. When you look at Acts 14, 12, Paul was the chief speaker. Paul, or Barnabas rather, recognized Paul's in the spotlight. I'm the man running the spotlight. You understand that? Sooner or later, in everything we do, we have to realize Who's in the spotlight? And who's running the spotlight? It takes both in order to work out effectively, efficiently, and properly. Now, just think, if you were going out of town, who would you take? 
Who would you take? Somebody that's going to sit there and gripe, whine, and complain all the time? No. Would you? No. So that says a lot about Barnabas in that Saul, Paul, would even take him with him. Everyone needs a, comp a companion, especially in the work of the Lord. You know that Jesus sent out the 12 in pairs in Mark 6, 7? Why do you think he did that? That's wise. That's, if for nothing else, that keeps accountability, doesn't it? Did you know that the Lord sent out the 70 in pairs in Luke 10 and verse 1? Now I ask you, who's your companion in the gospel? You know, there are some people in the Bible, when you look at it, you know them in pairs. The word Ananias, or the name rather, Ananias, is a pretty common term, but if I say Sapphira, you know who her companion is. But you hear Ananias, or hear Sapphira, and you automatically know Ananias, don't you? In Acts 5, 1 to 11, there's a pair that didn't work out too well. Did they? But then I say another name, Aquila. What would you say, Priscilla? Do you see? There are some people who are well known throughout the Bible for their work in the gospel. Do you know that it could very well be that your closest companion in the gospel could be your spouse? Mind blown, isn't it? Did you know in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 5, it seems that it was a custom of the apostles to take their wives with them. Why? Who's the best companion I have other than my wife? I don't have a dog. And if I had a dog, I wouldn't take the dog with me. Do you see? Who is your companion in the gospel? It could very well be that your best helper in the Lord is your spouse. Think about that. Number four. Barnabas was compassionate. Barnabas was willing to work with John Mark, the deserter. Let's look here in Acts chapter 13. Now at verse 13. We read most of it, but let's look at this verse in verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now we'll drive ourselves crazy or trying to figure out why John Mark left. I don't think you'll be able to find any reason specifically stated in the book of Acts as to the absolute reason why John Mark left. It could be that he got homesick. I don't know. Maybe he got scared. I don't know. It could be speculated a thousand different things. But the fact is, he deserted them. He left. Now, I want you to look at me in Acts 15. Acts 15 and verse 36. Don't forget this point. Point number four is that Barnabas was compassionate. Acts 15, 36, and some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. He deserted them in Acts 13, 13. And what's the Bible say? Barnabas says, he's going. Now, when you look at Colossians 4 and verse 10, it seems to indicate that Barnabas and Mark were kin. So is it the only reason that Barnabas said let's take John and Mark is because they were kin? Pause. Who was the only one that had courage enough to introduce Saul to the apostles? Yep, yeah, yeah, you got it. Barnabas. So it probably had nothing to do with them being kin and everything to do with Barnabas being filled with compassion. But look at verse 38. As he's going, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And, verse 39, the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. The gospel wins there. Instead of three going one way, you got four going two ways. You understand that? Now, think about this. 
I could only imagine if I would have been Barnabas. Boy, I'd have lit Paul up. I would have. I could see and I could hear exactly what I'd say. Who do you think you are? Who, what, do you, what were you doing just a few short years ago? What were you doing? You didn't just desert us. You were hailing us, taking us to prison. And now you've been forgiven of your mistake. Well, what about John Mark's mistake? Who do you think you are, Paul? Can you hear it? But then again, I could also hear Paul which if anyone ever lived that you wouldn't really want to argue with outside of Jesus or Solomon, I don't think you'd really want to try and argue with Paul. Because evidently, whatever John Mark did, Paul said, he ain't going. He ain't getting me out here again and abandoning me. Now, who was right and who was wrong? Well, in this sermon, Barnabas was right. <laughs> How about that? We won't say Paul was wrong. We'll just say Barnabas was more right. How about that? Okay, there you go. And obviously, brethren, what's implied between Acts 13.13 13 and Acts 15.36 and the verses that follow, whatever John Mark's weakness was, he corrected it. What, what it for whatever reason, he determined, I got to go. I'm homesick, maybe. Whatever. I got to go see my wife. Whatever. Whatever his weakness was, he corrected it. Now, application. Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever misspoken in your life? Have you ever made a misstep in your spiritual walk? Well, I think that you have, haven't you? Aren't you glad that somewhere along the line, somebody saw some potential in you and said, boys, he's repented of his wrong using. Aren't you glad? Or maybe you're one of those uh, select few who've never sinned in your entire life. Maybe you're one of them. I'm not. <laughs> and I doubt if you are, right? Right? All of us from time to time are going to make a misstep. We're going to misspeak. We're going to do something wrong. And we're going to look back and reflect and say, man, I wish I hadn't have done that. Will you still use me? What would you say? Now, I ain't saying Paul was wrong. Don't get out of here and say Brock said an apostle was wrong. I didn't say that. But I'm saying sometimes we need to slow down and think. All of us can misstep. All of us can miss speak. All of us, if we're not careful, can stumble into sin. Now what? You going to shoot a man while he's down? You going to say, you know what? You, I know I may have uh, taken men and women to prison. I may have persecuted the church, but once I got right, I stayed right. You think Paul never sinned as a Christian? Think again. Think again. Barnabas made a mistake, or John Mark made a mistake. Who's going to work with him? Barnabas. Praise the Lord for men like Barnabas who are willing to work with people through their grievous mistakes. Whatever John Mark did, he corrected it. Whatever his wrong was, he realized it and he stopped it. And Barnabas was compassionate enough to work with him. Oh, do we need a Barnabas. Application in Colossians 3. Look with me very carefully at this and very quickly. Colossians 3. Sooner or later, brethren, the gospel has to become a reality. The reality is that we as brethren are going to misstep. We're going to misspeak. We're going to do something sinful. Now what? Are we going to beat each other to death over it? What if the man is truly repentant? What do you do? You do Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says, put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing. Literally, that almost means putting up with. Forbearing one another and what? Sending the wrong away. Forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also what? So also do ye. Aren't you glad that Barnabas is in the Bible? I am. Everyone wants to be a Paul or a Simon Peter, but who wants to be a Barnabas? Anybody want to be a Barnabas? We need a Barnabas, that's for sure. There are those in the spotlight, and there are those who are behind the scenes. 
but both serve the same risen Savior, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. There is no place for jealousy or envy in the church of Christ. Brethren, we need to get to work. And you've got to start somewhere. Where does it start? Acts 2.40. Peter told them plainly, save yourselves from this untoward generation. How do I save myself? Hear the truth, Acts 18.8. Believe the truth, Acts 13.39. Repent of sin, Acts 3.19. Confess the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Romans 10.9 and 10. Be immersed in water so that your sins can be washed away, Acts 22.16. And brethren... We have to continue walking in the light as Christ is in the light. That means when we sin as Christians, we repent of that sin, we confess that sin unto God, we dust ourselves off and we keep on working. 1 John 1, 7 to 9. Realize where you are and do the right thing. Be called a good man before you leave this building tonight. Do it now as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.